And maybe it's possible in moments to notice that this acceptance of life on life's terms, this acceptance and this release, not clinging, that there's some peace And the heart knows how to do this. Say yes and not hold on. And this is what we mean by the restfulness of meditation. It's a practice for us, a training, a development. We practice together one breath at a time.
So I'll riff a little bit off of this next chapter in Listening to the Heart, Chapter 8, written by Kitty Sorrow this time, called Dew Drops and a Lightning Flash. This book, Listening to the Heart. But I'm just going to barely touch the material tonight because it's a important day for us to be together. One of the one of the things that Kitty Saro starts to talk a little bit about is his practice, practices, especially the Quan Yin, uh, Quan Yin practices. And just reading and living, more living than reading, honestly, just had me reflecting on like, what is the most nourishing thing right now? And so tonight I wanted to talk a little bit about refuge and what it means to seek refuge, especially at a time like this. And especially at a time like this, because for so many of us, so many spiritual beings, not just here in this room, but on this planet and a variety of spiritual traditions, all of the spiritual traditions, human beings come as seekers, and often seekers at a time when life is complicated. Maybe a time where there's a lot of suffering, a lot of confusion, and it's at these times and some, that something draws us in and we start to ask questions and get curious about what is this, you know, and how do we live in useful ways and how is it that the heart can be a little more free? And this is true in Buddhism, but not just Buddhism. And in, in Buddhist practice, each of the teachings, we might call them, the, the teachings are written down in these suttas, or we might call suttas, so each of the teachings. And sutta means something like thread. And so the idea is that the threads all weave together, and they are to be um, received as a complete offering. And it's in this complete offering that we start to realize the depth of the path. And we might come as seekers looking for something really, maybe even superficial, like I just don't want to have so much anxiety or I don't know what else to do. And the longer we practice, the more we're engaged walking this path in our unique unique ways, because it is slightly different for each of us, we start to feel into the depth and the breadth of this Buddhist path. And it's only when we actually ask questions and do that seeking that we start to learn we start to see how any one thread pulled alone is limiting the depth of our understanding. So this Buddhist path is made up of several parts and three big categories. This category of wisdom, deepening our clarity, deepening our understanding, clarifying for ourselves, wise understanding, 
clarifying our intentions. And then this second part of the path, this deepening presence. And that I've chosen to use that word presence, deepening presence tonight to talk about samadhi or point to samadhi, really uh, because I've been influenced by Kitty Saro and the deep devotional practice and the way when we deepen into what it means to be a human being and start to be curious about what leads to freedom and how we make sense and use our energies well in our lives, that, that more integrated depth we might call presence. And then this third part of the path is clarifying, purifying even our actions, the way that we move about in the world, our ethical training. So it's all of this together that makes the path so beautiful. Wisdom alone might seem dry and ethical training without really understanding our intentions might leave a legacy that we aren't intending. And the Buddha noticed on his journey that just developing a knack for concentration or jhana practice even is not enough if there's no wisdom that comes along with it. A wisdom that helps us really understand what it is we're doing, what it's what we're learning when we deepen into presence. So these three parts of the path, all of the teachings coming together in beautiful ways. And if you're like me, you can some you sometimes, well, let me just speak for myself. I sometimes ask questions. I want answers, right? I might say, well, I'm just, you know, going to be here and drop all expectations. And then before I know it, I'm like demanding something in my practice. No, you got to get me over this hurdle or what this, all this anxiety or living in these what if scenarios, like I don't want that anymore. And perhaps with all the uncertainty of the election, you've been here too. Anxiety and fear, just a lot of uncertainty. And the mind starts to replay these like what if scenarios. Like over the last 24 hours, I've been watching this just slew of what if, what if, what if. Like the mind, just this heart, this whole constitution, just looking for some certainty. And there's not certainty. There's not certainty. So this path doesn't isn't about answers, right? It isn't about finding an answer. But that part of being a spiritual seeker is about continuing to ask the questions, continuing to seek. And the seeking we might call going for refuge. It doesn't mean that we are somehow perfected, we've somehow perfected being a human. We're still messy. We still have lots of emotions, the whole range of human humanness. We might experience it all. But that move towards looking, like I'm going to seek freedom. I'm going to seek to understand. I'm going to see what this life, what these, what this practice has done for me. And I'm going to put some I'm going to put these energies to some action. This is going for refuge. And we do this at this move towards depth of understanding, towards freedom, again and again and again and again. And so at this really complicated time that we're living in here in the United States, with the election that just happened and the uncertainty around What's going to happen next? Perhaps you too are noticing that wisdom that's inside of you, or even the depth of love that's inside of you that keeps going like, oh, how do I relate to this with some skill? How do I support this own heart so that 
this being can relate to all of this and with some skill and provide some support to others. Be a force of good in the world. This is going for refuge, right? Every time we ask that question, well, what's the most useful thing now? And in that seeking, we might be able to feel into this surrender. I was noticing that today, off, so many times I noticed that today, just, you know, I, I would catch myself listening to the news or reading something in the media, and then like there wasn't enough wisdom to be with that activity, and there would be this increasing anxiety and tension until like you know, some more presence and more capacity to be there. And then the heart goes like, oh, this isn't helping, sweetie. Like, there's not enough wisdom here to, to do this right now. So, you know, then just literally like leaning back, taking a deep breath, like, okay, this is what it's like to seek right now. Just look at that. Seek and care about how to do this a little differently. Or that instinct to go outside and get some air. Like, oh, can this heart do better right now? Can this heart find some depth of presence right here in this world, like the world hasn't changed. The habits of this mind haven't changed, but there's this inner wisdom, this inner desire to seek something that might be more useful, might be more reliable. So go outside, get some air. And when there's space and the sun, it was a beautiful day today, I'm sure you'd agree. And just the system can settle down a little bit and feel into what it's like to be a part of nature, not separate from nature, but a part of this web of causality, a part of this changing nature, this system that's always in a state of change, this idea that there is a fixed self or a fixed state here is just not true. And sometimes we see that, wake up to that. So with the wind and the ground and the, a little more ease in the system, a little more capacity to rest, that can be felt. Like, ah, oh, look at this. There's a different way of relating that I can feel now. And just with that move to seek, to seek freedom, to seek a little refuge, what is a little refuge like right now? I listened to a talk by Brian LeSage. I really appreciate Brian's teaching. He's a teacher in Arizona and Flagstaff. He teaches at IMS and Spirit Rock too. He gave a talk last night. And he was talking about these what if questions that we have and both the value of them and the downfall of asking a lot of what if questions, like the system that tries to find some certainty when there isn't any. And his, his question was, it's not that asking what if questions are bad, but it's a matter of asking ourselves, what do we call home? Like, what do we rest the heart upon? What do we place our trust on? And so, with going for refuge, it's really pointing us in the direction of the deepest thing. What is the deepest thing? And this is why when we feel broken and despair and really suffering, we as human beings tend to go towards our spiritual practice because there's some surrender. Okay, I don't know what else to do. There's got to be a better way here. What do we call home? And this isn't supposed to be an easy question to answer. 
And remember, we're not supposed to get the answers. We're supposed to continue to seek. And so what do we call home should be a question that really challenges us. What do we call home? Am I placing my faith in a clear and succinct answer that's never going to change? Or in a political view? Or in some activity of looking for safety in this false sense of security? Looking for safety or security and knowing, and just the knowing, like, oh, I got it now. Oh, let me go back. Let me, okay, I got it now. Oh, wait, wait. Check the news alert. Oh, now I got it. It's like this. Oh, now it's like this. Have you caught yourself doing that to the news today? Like, oh, yeah, now I understand. This is what's going to happen. When it, we don't know. <laughs> we just don't know. We still don't know, right? And we might not know for weeks. Not just about who's going to win some of the races that we're looking at, but just how we're all going to relate to what's unfolding. And we might not know for weeks because how we're relating is changing in every moment. It depends on so many things. So it's not supposed to be something that is answerable or something that is even really easy to be with. This question of what do we call our home? So in Buddhism, when we talk about refuge or seeking refuge, we're really talking about the, the three refuges, the refuge of Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And these are Pali words for really common sense really common sense ideas. So taking refuge in the Buddha you know, means this finding a home in this heart that knows, this heart that can awaken, this heart that can see clearly, this heart that knows how to connect and be sensitive. Oh, doesn't that feel like a yes? Like, oh, this heart does know how to be sensitive. Why wouldn't I take refuge in that? Why wouldn't I call that a home? Rather than some idea of a permanent calm or an idea of something else. But this heart that can continue to pulsate with life and feel it, to know it to know what it's like to be here, to not turn away or be in denial. This is taking refuge in Buddha. And we take this, we get this modeled from the historical Buddha himself who lived and taught. Right? So we can feel like we're a part of this ancestry, a lineage, as we connect with this heart that knows how to be sensitive. And that's a really nice practice to go like, oh yeah, just for a moment, to know what it's like to be mindful, or to be aware, or to care, and to feel into the sensitivity of the heart, and go, like, oh yeah, like there have been Buddhists for 2,600 years doing the same exact move, ah, oh, connecting, finding some presence, being here, and finding how that feels good, and it's actually trustworthy. And so we become connected in this moment to lots of wise beings, beautiful wise beings from the time of the Buddha on down. Never alone. Remembering and realizing that we belong somewhere. And this taking refuge in Dhamma, this taking refuge in the way it is, so this question of how is it and the depth and the breadth of that reality, how it is, so that 
the answer is always challenging. Like, how is it now? Oh, it's like this. And we can feel that. But we also know, like know that, okay, everything is changing. That's a hard reality sometimes. It's actually a beautiful reality and an enlivening reality. But it can be a hard reality too. Or this reality that there's so much suffering in the world. Or there's so much suffering in this heart. All of this reactivity and difficulty that I'm experiencing right now, that's not easy to bear. I care about this suffering. I care about all the suffering that's being illuminated for us in this country. All of the history this, and all of the work we have left to do. All of the divisiveness and the racism. All of the every moment that we feel into when we realize, oh, we don't know how to belong to each other. That's hard to take in. But this is the way it is. And so when this sensitive heart knows how to connect with that truth, with these truths, it's also relieving. Like, oh, I don't have to be afraid of this. I may not know what to do, but I know that this is the truth. And because it's the truth, it's, it's a place I can call home. And then this third refuge of Sangha or community. Not community of perfect humans or perfect meditators. I mean, one of the reasons why I appreciate using the chat in the beginning of a program is because we can see, like, oh, we're, look at this. We have feelings. We're not just a bag of habits. We have life experiences and we're willing to articulate them. And it feels good to be in a real community, a community of real people right, that are struggling through things. Because this is what it means to seek, to seek refuge, right? Is to struggle through things, to keep looking, to keep riding ourselves on the path. And so how can we do that if we're not a community of real people? And so this taking refuge in Sangha is appreciating that there are a bunch of real people here who care, just like I do. We may not have answers, we may not know what to do, but we're going to keep trying. We're going to keep practicing, cultivating the sensitivity of heart that allows us to be right in the middle of the present moment and use our life energies to support our own life and each other. This is it. This is a very gross summary of the path and a gross summary of what it means to take refuge in Sangha. And we could think of Sangha in two ways. Sangha, like here, in a group like this at Common Ground, or you might think about all the, you know, that I work with teenagers. In addition to my job here at Common Ground, I work as a social worker with teenagers. And I find it so enlivening to be with them in their uh, messy little ways, you know, this figuring out how to do life. And like, they just keep trying. Fall down, get back up get mad, quit, come back, right? Somebody goes to get them, helps put them back on the path. We just keep, this is it, this is how we live. So you might think of Sangha in wide ways, like, oh, your family and friends and all your influences and all the interconnected ways that we live our lives. It's hard to imagine that any of our energies are just for us when we think about how many people we come in contact with or talk to and somehow have an impact on. And it might be useful too to remember that Sangha also means the monastic community of really devoted people from the time of the Buddha who have given their complete lives over to finding freedom so that they can help help write us on the path when we need that.
And when we take refuge, it's essentially an act of taking refuge in the teaching of karma. So it's like this radical surrender to living in alignment with this understanding that every intentional action leaves a legacy. So not being in denial about that. Taking refuge is a way of understanding the depth of karma. So this heart that knows how to be sensitive, this cultivation of a sensitive heart that can connect with the truth, the depth of the truth of things and understand that it really matters how we use our energies. Because if we just allow ourselves to be mindlessly engaged in our lives, we create messes. There are these tendencies of heart and mind that proliferate and cause a mess. The tendencies of greed and hatred and ill will, confusion. But we don't have to believe this. We can check it out. This is what it means to seek refuge. We keep looking. Like, oh, does my life work better when I'm practicing or not? Is there any, does, is it supportive? Does it support my relationships, my engagements, my understanding? So when we understand karma, we take a refuge in the quality of our own intentions because it's here in the quality of our own intentions that our, we start to see the impact of our practice on our lives. It can feel sometimes oppressive to connect with the immense suffering in the world. And in order to do that, we need to be able to connect with energies that are supportive, that know how to receive the complicatedness of our lives and our hearts and our communities. And so this taking refuge, this seeking refuge, really is a way to connect with some of these useful energies like love. I don't know, if just when I was talking through what it's like to be in a lineage, to take refuge in Sangha, to be in a lineage of human beings who continue to care and apply that. Just, you know, there's a settling into this, the depth of love, like, oh, people really have shown up throughout time, have cultivated goodness, and have shared that with each other. And that's so beautiful. And have continued to go back, so establishing faith. I was when we were sitting together, I was just appreciating how this, you know, that I've been practicing for a while now, and many of you have too, and that this heart knows how to do that move of going back to the present moment for refuge. Like, oh, I know how to practice. And when the going gets tough, the heart goes, okay, sweetie, just surrender. It's hard right now. And that's that move of going back and connecting. We learn something there about what's useful. And here we develop this faith in practice and doing that. And so it becomes natural to look to the present moment 
to surrender to the present moment. This is something from Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams today. I thought it was a beautiful description of refuge. She says, our anxiety comes from the desire to have things be different. There's going to be the day after the election and the day after that. We need to be present to what is regardless of the outcome you want. My ancestors had to prepare themselves over and over again for moving toward a freedom that was nowhere in sight. We prepare for life as it unfolds, not our ideal image of it. That is literally the only path forward. And hopefully you could hear in these words that acceptance, going to refuge in the present moment, and that act of seeking that really lands us in a place of faith in that move towards the present moment. In another beautiful, uh, just a really beautiful description of faith and refuge and seeing clearly, not turning away, being here with the way things are. From Marcy Rendon, who is a, a local author, wonderful author. This is on a social media post. And she said, I see a lot of posts from folks talking about leaving the country. This is called geographical escape. If you don't clean up a mess or leave without looking at your part in something, you just recreate it someplace else. It's the dysfunction that settlers brought here way back in 1492. They left the era of inquisition back in Europe, but never healed from the sickness of that level of dysfunction. And they brought their fear and hatred here and built a country on genocide and destruction. Unless you heal from this, you will just carry the disease with you somewhere else. No other country wants this level of oppression and dysfunction. No other country. And when I read that, I felt like hopeful. Like, yes. I'm a practitioner, just like you. We know how to do this. We know how to connect. We know how to seek refuge in the sensitivity of the heart, even when it's hard. Because we learn in these moments to connect with something bigger, this energy of love that really cares about the way things are. And when we purify the heart in this way, then our legacy becomes useful. Right? We leave behind a legacy of intention, of presence, of care, of fearlessness in our actions and the words that we speak. Maybe I'll read one thing from this other great book called Choosing Compassion, How to Be a Benefit in the World that Needs Our Love by Anam Tupton, who's a Tibetan teacher. It's a wonderful book. He says, perhaps many of the problems that we face each day, both globally and personally, come from disconnecting with the sacred. The experience of the sacred is something essential that we are missing right now in this world. We can awaken to this experience by opening our hearts. When we open our hearts, the sacred is something that we can all taste and feel. The experience of the sacred is not an idea or a concept. It is not simply the esoteric belief. Of course, it can be turned into a concept or a belief. When that happens, we are cut off from something very precious and vital. 
This can lead to a host of problems. We can forget that nature, the environment that surrounds and nurtures us, is rare and precious. We can forget that it is sacred and that we are ourselves and that we ourselves are sacred too. Every human is every human being is sacred. Can you imagine how amazing it would be if humanity suddenly woke up and realized and treated each other accordingly? We would live in a very different world, a much more loving, peaceful, and joyful world. Seeking refuge is about connecting with the sacred. Feeling into presence with the sacred right here. The sensitive heart, sacred. Deep, deep truth, sacred. And human beings that reflect all of the goodness and all of the challenge of being human. Sacred humanity. Thanks for listening, everyone. Be good to hear from others. There's about 15 minutes left, so plenty of time to share your own thoughts, reflections with the group. You can just unmute yourself when the time is right. And it's always okay to say what you have to say, even if your mind went in a different direction. This is what it's like to honor the full depth and breadth of the human expressions. So don't, don't hesitate. It's fine. You don't have to have a question. It doesn't have to be well-formed, your statement. You can just talk. Hey, <laughs> that may be all that's there right now. Like, well, I know that this isn't it. And I've had a few seconds of peace and it's involved the breath. So I'm going to go try that. Right. So, but there's something in there that, you know, that makes you want to do that. That makes you want to connect with the breath. Like I want to connect here. And so instead of practicing so that you can attain something, you might challenge yourself to see if you can just connect with that wholesome desire to want some relief, that wholesome want, you know, that wholesome desire for relief. Like, oh, I don't want to suffer anymore. This sucks. This is really hard. And I don't know what's going to help, but I know that staying in the centrifuge isn't. And so instead of trying to purchase something from the breath, expect it to pay dividends, which is not a Chuck problem, it's an all of us problem. We all do that. We all at times have this relationship with the breath where we expect it to really deliver. But we'd see if we can just connect with that really wholesome desire that's there. Like, oh, I don't want to suffer. And it's there in moments when we do even, you know, unskillful things like all of the hours I spent checking the election results today. There's a seed of that that's even there. Like, oh, I care about people. I care about how this is going to go. Yeah. So I don't want to demonize myself. We don't want to somehow demonize ourselves for not being evolved enough or something like that, right? Not having enough wisdom or enough patience or enough calm. 
but see if we can recognize that seed of goodness that's there even if it's a little misguided or a little confused. And perhaps it's that in that connection with that healthy, wholesome desire that helps us relax into our humanness and accept what's happening a little bit more. And we all know that when we can accept and when we're not pushing, things go a bit easier in practice, right? Ancestors had to prepare themselves over and over again for moving toward a freedom that was nowhere in sight. We prepare for life as it unfolds, not our ideal image of it. That is literally the only path forward. To like allow our hearts to move and do the next right thing. And sometimes the next right thing is just feeling all of this, right? Like all of the, like, wow, this is what it likes. This is what it's like when human beings feel afraid and, or terrified and vulnerable. Like, you know, it's easy to go to blame. It's easy to go to hatred, something that's a protective strategy. Look at this. It's arising right here in me. Sometimes the move is just to connect with that, like, oh, it's humbling to go like, yep, yeah, totally human. Look at this. On every level, human. That's the move towards connection. That's the move towards taking refuge in Buddha that knows Dhamma. Right here. Like the sensitive heart that connects with that reality. Ah, oh, this heart has all kinds of capabilities, tendencies. And that connection back with karma, like, oh, so I want to take care of this heart so that this heart knows how to move from a place of love more often. Yeah, thank you for your time and attention, careful attention, listening, love, patience, practice. Connection with the, the sacred, being together, being a community, showing up, yeah. being here. Patrice, would you do us the honors? Sure. So let's all together commit this act of imaginative generosity we call sharing the merit. So in our time together tonight, if there's any benefit, any blessing, any good that's come to us from learning and sharing and being together tonight, we would gladly, joyfully, happily share it with others. We'd share it with those we know, parents, teachers, friends, family, our community, all those that we know. And we also wholeheartedly share it with those we don't know. And we especially tonight Share it with those who may have a really different view of how things should be than we have. So we share these blessings with all, with all humans, with all four-leggeds, with all two-wingeds. May we all find refuge and may we all find a path to the deepest peace. And may that be so for us all. Amen. Thanks, Patrice. Feel free to unmute yourself and say goodbye if you'd like. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. So Thank good you. to be together. Good night.